So, topic tonight is hate the sin, love the sinner. You guys heard that before? Most of us, all of us, right? Um, and, you know, I text that as my topic to Isaac, and he came back with seeing the sinner behind the sin, you know, which are, you know, both related. And I got some takeaways at the end, but I put one of mine here on the front, and probably my bottom line about this is, is, uh, it's a deep subject for such a shallow mind. And I'm sure you've heard that. I, uh, when I was young, a couple years ago, um, I was in a conversation, uh, a couple, three people or whatever, and there was, a, there was an older lady that was in the conversation. And somebody started their sentence with, well, you know, before they get the rest out, she comes out with, it's a deep subject for such a shallow mind, you know. I think that was kind of derogatory. This is not, this is fact. This is, you know, comparing my mind to this topic. It's a deep, broad, long topic. And uh, it's kind of overwhelming. Um, but uh, we'll get into it and jump right in. You know, guys need a telescope to see that? Can you even see it? Um, <laughs> now you need a telescope, don't you? Anyway, I can walk you through it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, break this phrase term down. And I think this thing skipped. Maybe not. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to talk about hate the sin, love the sinner. Um, hating the sin and the sinners. Hate the sin, love the sinner pertaining to ourselves. Uh, hate the sin, love the sinner pertaining to our Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, hate sin, love the sinner pertaining to today's culture. Right? And then uh, hate the sin, love the sinner pertaining to the Lord's church. How, you know, we're going to walk through those tonight. Um, as far as the phrase, uh, I'm going <coughs> to... It, this is not you can't find this phrase in the Bible you know you can't see this literal text anywhere in the Bible of course it's talked about and the principles are talked about all through the Bible and Christ talks about them God talks about them but uh, uh, the originators were uh, St. Augustine who was a saint in the church around the year 424 Catholic Church uh, in his letter, I guess they lettered a uh, number of the letters back then, but his letter 211, he talked about some of the, you know, bad activities of the nuns, some of the convents, and he used this phrase to uh, work that. The, uh, and then later on, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, most of us probably know who that was. He picked it up. He was the... Uh, led the national nonviolent revolution for India against the British rule, right? And uh, he used this term. Uh, his primary point about this term was, you know, it's never going to happen. You know, man can't separate, you know, sin from the sinner. That was his take on this phrase. And then that last line that you can't see is, uh, and I can barely see Christians cannot use the uh, phrase to water down the judgment that awaits those who continuously decide to sin, right? So this is not something to separate the sin from a sinner. You know, sinner sins, he can look for judgment, right? We all know that. So this is where the phrase originated. Um, uh, the guys that are credited for using it primarily and then my statement at the bottom. Okay. Um, I'm going to put my glasses on. So, we'll jump right into it. And one of the dangers of this phrase, and I'll read this to you and then we'll talk about it, is uh, I got this off the internet and this is somebody's feedback, comments about this phrase, is that Ask anyone on the receiving end of being loved while their sin is hated. They will tell you it's the same as being hated 
for the exact reasons Gandhi wrote, because it's virtually impossible to love someone but hate the sin. Right? Uh, that second bullet there is, we get caught up in judging them and we feel self-righteous compared to them. We won't, ju uh, we won't just let the issue be, leave, leave the issue between them and God, but continue to bring it up and try to change it. And so the poison of hatred spreads in the world, just as Gandhi said. So, you know, there's a couple things going on here in the background. One is either somebody, you know, and I got here listed that may be a Pharisee, or somebody has, you know, taken this phrase in some way and tried to talk to, help a sinner, but done it in a wrong way. You know, they've been abrasive and just you know, told them right straight out, you know, if you're going to hell, don't change your ways, and, you know, that type of deal. Somebody's either done that, or this person that wrote this comment has got a bad attitude. No humility, right? So, those are a couple of dangers to this phrase and comments about this phrase that you'll find. Um, and in Luke 18, 9, 14, pray for, um, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed, Thus God, I thank you that I am like not like all other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast a week, I give tithes of all that I get. So was, this Pharisee, you know, was probably one of those who would address that person right like that to cause them to have the attitude that we see in the first two bullets. Uh, next, one of our bullets topics that were, you know, listed was sin. And a definition that I found for sin is capacity to experience and appreciate feeling good. We desire to do evil things because of momentary pleasures or good feelings they can give. Pretty good definition, right? Temporary good feelings. Kind of wrap sin up, I think. And next, the decision to participate in sin is influenced by many factors. One is parents. Primarily a positive uh, factor, right? And in Proverbs 22, 6, train up the child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, right? You know, we talked about uh, salt of the earth. I talked about salt of earth in the devotion. And I don't think... One of, the, one of the best examples that I can think of salt of the earth is a Christian mother, you know. Applied to this uh, uh, comment here, you know, p the parents, you know, um, a lot of kids don't have a chance, you know. They're probably in a single parent family or their parents don't care and are not Christians. So parents are a big factor in sin. And of course, Satan, First Peter uh, five eight, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary is the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may de uh, devour. So, this is uh, of course a negative uh, factor in sin, right? Satan's waiting on us at every turn, any and everything, you know. He's waiting on us to provide, put in front of us those temporary pleasures, right, and feelings. Uh, our friends, for, uh, Proverbs thirteen twenty: he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of foes shall be destroyed. So there's another factor. Who you associate your with, who you grow up with, you know, is going to affect sin in your life. So, I don't, uh, I appreciate the efforts of the parents. And I meant to say this up front, and this is something that needs to be said, I'm going to say it. Uh, I talked about me and Tim working with the uh, high school group. And, you know, I watch kids as my kids are growing up through high school and stuff and watch the other kids around them and, you know, notice them. But these kids here at Chapel Hill, 
you know, they're different. They are some of the best kids I've ever been around. And it's not, they are spiritually, for sure. And, you know, that's to me the primary thing they should be. But there have been, these kids that we, you know, worked with are so, they're so intelligent. And, and it's, it's not just one or two, you know, that I've seen. And I think maybe uh, Dalton Todd was in one of the first class. That's how long we've done it. So we've seen most of the kids over the last several years. And, and you, know what the, you know what that is? It's their parents, you know? These kids have been fortunate enough to have Christian parents, and the parents have done, done it in the right way, raised them in the right way. And that's a compliment. And I'm, it is what it is, you know? And I do appreciate them and appreciate you parents. Um, Let's see if we can move on. I uh, I hate you guys. Can you see this? It's not that good, but you know I'd like to be seen it anyway. I worked hard on it. <laughs> um, so still still on the subtopic of sin. For hate the sin, love the sinner. Uh, these days, our culture. That first topic is modern therapeutic culture. What do we do these days? If somebody's got an issue. Uh, such as gambling, sex, pornography, pedophilia, thievery. What do we do? We cast uh, those sins into some kind of affliction or addiction. The world does. I'm not talking about, you know, the church. The world does. They want to say, if you're a drunkard, your daddy abused you. Or is in your genes, right? That's, that's the way the world is and has become. Uh, you know, I thought about that and sometimes I... Those, there are a lot of good, and this mentions the uh, 12 Steps, AA, I guess, and those type programs, you know, that's what, that's what we try to use today to help those folks. And I'm, I've been around some of them, seen some of them, and they've helped a lot of folks, I think, you know, to get the first steps to recovery and for people to be there to help them when they need it. But when it comes down to it, you can't sugarcoat sin, you know? I don't think you can do it in today's society through those uh, different addiction, you know? It's all about you gotta love yourself, you know, you gotta walk through these 12 points and all that's good, but when it comes down bottom line, you know, you gotta work it out with you and God and Christ. Um, so, Sin is inherited depravity that is part of our fallen human nature since the Garden of Eden. And I got a couple of verses from Romans there. One is 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? Um still on the subtopic of a sin. Who should be our role model in this hate the sin and love the sinner? Who should we look to to know what steps to take to hate the sin and love the sinner? God, right? God, Christ. You know, we got, we got to pick up our cross daily and walk closer to His path. And no different here in working with folks and using this phrase. Um, uh, most religions agree that uh, God hates sin. We all know that He hates sin. Uh, over and over the Bible stresses the fact that God despises iniquity, right? Over and over we see it in the Bible how He did. You can talk about stories right and left. Um, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah told, uh, God told Jeremiah to speak to the Israelites about their sin, saying, However, I have sent you to all my servants, to the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate. So God does hate sin. Romans uh, 1, 18 through 32, or uh, verse 18 is what I have here. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So God is acting. God hates sin and He does act on it. 
um, still on the subtopic of sin. Uh, God is our role model. Is it the truth that God hates sinners? Uh, in Job 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Right? Example of the uh, potential wrath from God. Uh, and in 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth of their wickedness. Right? So God, we're thinking now, God probably hates sin, right? And then you turn around and look at it, and you look at Romans 5, 6, and 8. Uh, any person who has read the Bible understands that one of the greatest things is love. He loved us when we were yet sinners. In Romans 5, 6, and 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? So he does love us. And he doesn't hate sinners. Right? And he's our role model. And this is how he loves us. You know, he loves us while at times when we're sinning, in times when we didn't care about him, all we cared about were those temporary feelings that we wanted of sin. He still loved us, and he always will. Uh, Bible writers are using a figure of speech called metonymy. And, you know, it's kind of like, so we talk about God hates sinners, right? And we talk about and see his love. And in those places where we see, for example, maybe Ananias and Sapphira, where he, uh, you know, their sin was, you know, they didn't bring the entire amount uh, and lay it at Peter's feet. Uh, he mentions him, but Minotomy is defined as a figure by which one name or noun is used instead of another, such as I hate Shakespeare. You don't really hate Shakespeare; you hate his writing. You guys remember that? I had a question I was going to ask y'all tonight. One is, kids, I don't see any kids, but are they still doing Shakespeare in high school? Are they? I didn't know. Poor kids. Um, that'd be a good reason not to go to class. Um, and then Proverbs 6, 19, it mentions God hates a lying tongue. This is another example of this me, me tongue. Is, uh, God hates the sin that a tongue can perform. God doesn't hate a physical tongue. He hates that. He hates that sin that that tongue can perform, right? So God doesn't hate sinners. He hates the potential, you know, of people sinning. That's what he hates. Uh, and then our second topic, subtopic, is pertaining to myself as a Christian. And our first bullet is hate our sin and love ourselves. Okay. Who's the hardest on us? We probably are, right? Many times we are. And uh, many times unnecessarily, I think. You know, we're all harder on ourselves. I know a lot of times I am. Um, and as far as loving ourselves as God did, you know, one thing we can do is we can love ourselves not to put ourselves in a position to sin, right? You know, we as uh, Christians and part of the church know and understand what the sins are. Look in Romans, there they are. There's a list of them, right? So we got to love ourselves not to put ourselves in a position to sin, right? I think that makes pretty good sense. It's like me. Man, I love cornbread. You know, that's that's one weakness is cornbread. Carol cooks pretty good cornbread. Sometimes I'll try not to put myself in the position of eating too much of it, you know. And that's just an example. Um, but people should. If you're really committed to not sinning, and, you know, being a Christian you should be, you don't need to be places that you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be thinking thoughts you shouldn't be. So help yourself 
and don't get close to that. Do something. Uh, love your, yourself enough to develop and maintain daily study and prayer habits, right? You know, there's, there's things we can do. And this, this is a part of loving yourself to help you, uh, you know, have a better life, Christian life. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, we're taught to pray without ceasing, Christ told us. Uh, Hebrews 11.25, be like Moses, take a stand. And that verse is, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Make that stand, make that conscience stand like you guys have tonight. Be here tonight. You know, you're here tonight. Make the conscious decision of being here every time a door is open. Right? Help yourself out. Being here with fellow Christians is one of the primary ways you can help yourself out and avoid sin. Uh, pertaining to myself as a Christian, still a subtitle, you, di you dislike someone who hurt you, so you refuse to love them the way the Lord loves you. It could be hate the sin, love the sinner, except when they sin against me. Right? I've kind of struggled with this one over the years. You know, I've always kind of, I've always kind of took a little pride in myself. You know, sun goes down, I go to bed, that's over with. You know, you know, at at work, you know, wherever, you know, your relationships with people. If something happens and you know you get a little tension, you know, let it be gone that night. You know, uh. I don't want to bring baseball into it too much, but I might this one time. It's like, you know, Rex is a reliever. He'll go out sometimes, you know, and they'll beat him around. You know, base hits, walks, home runs. He has a bad night, you know. And one of the things we go back and forth about is, and we usually text each other after every game is, hey, you can hate it tonight, it's over tomorrow, you know. And the other thing is, you know, it was bad, but there's something in there that you can pick out that'll help you. Even though it was terrible, there's something in there you can pick out that can make yourself better. And uh, he's got to love himself and love himself pitching to do that. Uh, let me read Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So if you do have somebody and uh, you think they've sinned against you, you know, how are you supposed to love them? you got to love your enemies, right? Oh, uh, still pertaining to uh, myself as a Christian, um, think about the parable of the in Matthew of the uh, unforgiving servant. It's uh, Matthew eighteen thirty three through thirty five. Uh, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do every one of you. If you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So forgiving those who have trespassed against you is part of hate the sin, love the sinner, except when it works in our favor. Um, so at some point, if we can get something out of it, as uh, that guy, when he went before his master and his master let him go and forgot all that he owed him, and then he went, he went to his servant and choked him and beat him and threw him in jail to get his money. You know, we have to uh, hate the sin and love the sinner all the time, not on a conditional basis, and just when it's good for us. Uh, pertaining to our Christian brothers and sisters, hate the sin, love the sinner. Um, we just celebrated D-Day in the memory of uh, D-Day few weeks ago, maybe a month, there's a story, and I'll see if I can get this straight, about uh, a Captain Fink who was over 
X amount of soldiers, and uh, he admitted he is a little over, uh, heavyweight. So he was on one of the boats that was behind his men. And when he came in, you know, he saw his men all huddled behind all these structures or anything. You know, it's said that that day that there was an actual wind caused because there were so many bullets in the air. And when he came, came ashore, he badly sprained his ankle. So uh, he grabbed, a, I guess, a stick or whatever and was using that a cane. And he came on shore and he saw his men, you know, you've seen the picture of them hiding on the things on the beach. He saw them doing that, right? So he, uh, he hollers out, you know, you got to get out of here and get to the bank, you know, warning them. You know, and he didn't, this Captain Fink, he was an actual man, it's not fiction. You know, he's not the one that said the only, there's two types of people on this beach. There's the ones that are dead and the ones that are going to be dead, right? He didn't actually say that, but he was trying to get his men to head toward the bank to safety, right? And he was just hollering out at them. And they were just, they were just laying behind that cover, you know, that they had. And then he started going down the line and he would hit them with that cane. It's like, go to the bank, you know. You're going to be dead. Go to the bank. So he was pointing them out, and they started moving. When he did that, they started moving to safety. Um, so, what about us? Do we need Captain Finks in our pulpit, pews, and as brothers and sisters in Christ today? People who are not afraid to tap on someone's shoulder as part of this hate the sin, love the sinner. It, uh, and how should we do it? Christ and God are our model, right? You're not to be brash. You're not to be graceless. You're not to be harsh. You're not to come up and tell them you're a sinner and if you don't change your ways, you know where you're going, right? That's not the way. And, uh, you know, I've been, I've been in some situations and had some experiences like this. And that's one reason I did this tonight was, you know, it was... I've had some personal situations to where this type of stuff was going on. People that I loved and were, you know, mentors to me. And sin just, and Satan had them just where they wanted them, right? And patience has been my experience. Patience and, of course, long-suffering and love will eventually get you will eventually get them to where you know they should be it hadn't been in my experience all the cases to end up that way but there have been some and I think that's the way we should address this um, Matthew 7 4 and 5 can we discuss our brother's sins once we have dressed our own so this is that scripture that we all know about you know don't call out the uh splinter that's in your brother's eye when you got a log in your eye, right? But it does say, uh, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat uh, out of my brother's eye, right? You know, I had an experience maybe a year ago or whatever uh, of a young man who, uh, great heart, you know, and he, he did he was doing a lot of work in the church, you know, for the Lord at one time. And then I had heard that he kind of faded away, and uh, I saw him somewhere. And I asked him, hey, you know, where are you going to church now? He's like, well, I ain't going. I was going over there, and something happened, all this stuff, so I ain't going. I looked at him, I said, man, you know better than that. You know, you was your mom and daddy, and, you know, you I know you know better than that. And uh, I don't do that too much. I don't. But I think I should probably do it more. You know, we're kind of, as Christians, in this thing together. And if we do see a brother or sister, you know, that we know is struggling, um, I think it's definitely our job and position as their. Uh, brother or sister to step up and tap them on the shoulder. Hey man, you got a couple things you got to get straightened out here. Right? But um, 
And you know, one thing that keeps me from doing that is that is because I think I got a log in my eye, you know, stuff in that I need to get cleaned up before I can talk to them about it. And I think that stops a lot of us a lot of times. But, you know, and I may be wrong, you guys be willing, you go right ahead, but if I'm, for example, at church every time the doors open, right? I'm here all the time, you know, and don't miss. And like this young man, you know, he's not going anymore. I feel like I got the right to say something to him, you know? You know, maybe my eye for that, for that sin, it's pretty clear, you know. But his, you know, he needs to get his straightened out. And I think it's our job to tell him. Does that make sense? Y'all sleep. Here we go. Yes, sir. Proverbs 13, uh, verse 3 and 4. It's talking about a father and a son, but it's just as applicable to a, a brother and a brother that says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. We're talking about hate the sin and loving the sinner. If we don't discipline the sinner, we don't love him. <coughs> exactly. And that's, you know, that's a major point of this. And, he, you know. <coughs> That tough love, you know, to me, I got some tough love, you know, back when. I still get some now, but that that helps, you know, sometimes more than just, you know, the other of maybe cards, visits, that type stuff. A little tough love go a long way, I think. Thanks, Alan. That's good. Um, but we do. We need to help, you know, reach out, have an op open hand to our brother, you know, at any point, I think. Uh, and that's part of being that salt, I think. Uh, why would we not address our sins and others? Um, I have coddled others' sins because I secretly, secretly wanted the others to coddle mine, you know. I don't want to step out and say something to you because I'm afraid you'll say something back to me. That's one thing that keeps us from it. Um, uh, uh, Matthew 7, 1, Christ warning the scribes and Pharisees, it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. You know, this This is what a lot of... I'll go ahead and go there. We ain't got much time. Um, the LGBT. Is that right? Q. Thank you. You know, a lot of the... And I read this in a couple of places... A lot of the people for that use this. Don't be judging me, you know. Or I'll turn around and judge you. And that's not what this verse is about. You know, this verse was about Christ talking to the Pharisees and them wearing their righteousness on the sleeve. It's, it's like we taught the, uh, the Pharisee uh, and the tax collector prayer of where the Pharisee says, I know I'm great, Lord. I do all these things, you know. Uh, Judge not that you be not judged. Christ was talking to those Pharisees. Hey, you better not be judging him because you will be judged one day, right? And then Philippians 2, 4, concern for others. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, what do you guys see in there? Yeah, I ain't done this. I'm going to do it now and see how it works. I'll catch up. Y'all should have told me, what? Tell me. Man, y'all love me. <laughs> That's the last bell, too. Uh, and y'all can't see these, so there's no sense in doing it. I appreciate your time. Like I said in the beginning, this has meant a lot to me. You know, it. Uh, you got to bump your comfort zone. My daddy was all about that. You know, all of us got our zones. This is one of my zones I had to bump. This one ain't easy for me. But I do enjoy it. And I know it wasn't as big as hard with y'all, like it is some people I don't know. Um, but I do appreciate your time and attention. And uh, let's have a word of prayer before we leave. Shall we pray? Our most heavenly and righteous Father, we come before you thanking you for this opportunity to gather midweek and to refresh ourselves and our souls and our spirits with your teachings. 
Heavenly Father, to never help us to never take for granted this opportunity to meet with the saints and to study Your Word. Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, You'll help us all to study and develop habits of prayer and study, that we'll be better Christians. Heavenly Father, we know that You love us and that You don't hate sinners. You hate the sin. Heavenly Father, we pray that You'll be with, the rest, be with us the rest of this week. Bring us back. Lord's Day. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for Your Son, that He is a gift of the ages, and that He was willing to come to this earth and be tortured, spit upon, and then be crucified, and then to be raised, that we may have hope of eternal life, Heavenly Father. Help us as we leave, Heavenly Father, to help others to help others that we might see are having struggles or in trouble. Heavenly Father, we know that all things are possible for You and help us to always look to You for our strength. And it's in Your Son's name we pray. Amen.